And now, The Low Post. Welcome to The Low Post Podcast, fresh off an absolutely epic weekend of basketball and an especially epic Sunday where the Sixers uh, are gone and Luka had an incredible game and Donovan Mitchell and Jamal Murray had 50 in the same game. Uh, just an incre- and, and just an incredible day, honestly. And Clips Mavs, capped by Luka's buzzer beater, just an absolute legend moment. Maybe the game of the year in the NBA, although I'm sure there were good games in November that have been completely erased from my brain. Uh, and we have, this is the best series of the playoffs. It, it's the only series right now that's 2-2. So let's talk about it with the one and only Tim McMahon from ESPN. How are you, sir? Howdy, partner. Doing all right. Hanging Yourself? in, right? Hanging, Hanging in. in. Right. So that was a game. Wow. Yeah, and look, Mavs are down 21 in the second quarter. No Porzingis. I'm thinking, okay, I need to get ready to write my uh, kind of Mavs season a bit, looking forward to the future. And basically, Luca decided, no, that 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 ain't going to be the story. That's not uh, that that's not the way this is going to go down. And under any circumstances. That's one of the best playoff performances I've ever seen. I mean, the guy had 43, 17, and 13, numbers that have never been put up by a single player in, in one playoff game, capped it with a buzzer beater, the first guy to put up 40-plus and hit a buzzer beater uh, since, uh, I believe, since Michael Jordan. Um, actually, I think quite last year, too. But regardless, just ridiculous. And then, by the way, this dude's a game-time decision right, on an ankle that he sprained about 40 hours earlier. I mean, it just – and he's 21 years old. It's insane. Um, and he looked a little ginger in the first yeah. four or five minutes of the game when he was landing. He settled for a mid-range jumper on his first shot of the game, which he's, he's really excised those kind of shots from his pick-and-roll game. And I thought, ooh, that's not a good sign. And then, of course, he, he absolutely explodes. And that shot – that shot – like, it was going in. You knew it was going in. As soon as he launched it, I was like, it's going in. There's no, it's just no, it has to go in. But you know what? I agreed with Trey Burke. Trey Burke said, honestly, when he let it go, I thought he could have gotten a better shot. I like Trey Burke <laughs> caping for, like, the analytics guys who are like, hero ball. Trey Burke is like, actually, you know, it was, we really could have probably generated a better shot. <laughs> but look, I mean, first of all, uh, how Reggie Jackson ends up guarding him, Ah, I don't know, man. I that 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 can't happen if you're the Clippers. There, I understand there was a switch. Kawhi's got to fight through it. You can't have Reggie Jackson on him. But I thought Luca did him a favor by settling for that step back. That's the best shot the Clippers could hope he takes in that situation. But to your point, this was going to be Luca's day. He was going to knock down that shot. Um, and you know what? The the other crazy thing about it. The Mavericks' one massive flaw all year long has been they have been and they've been one of the worst clutch teams in the league, and a lot of that's that Luca has really struggled in the clutch all season long, and there he had a lot of great clutch moments as a rookie, but this year, last minute of fourth quarter regulation on go ahead or game tying uh, potential game tying shots, he was zero of ten in the regular season, zero of ten. You he know, was three of three in the last fifty seconds yesterday. I was going to say his last yeah. fifty seconds of overtime were layup, layup, buzzer beating three. I don't mind the look only because three point seven seconds left. You've some for some reason, and by the way, this goes to show you that even the very best will mess up sometimes. For some reason, Rick Carlisle calls a play to throw the ball into the backcourt, eighty feet from the rim, knowing mm-hmm. the Clippers have a foul to give. They give it with three point seven seconds left. Perfect. For the Clippers, that is like perfect. If you get a shot where you can see the rim cleanly, yeah. three point seven, like I, I can live with it. Like if you get a clean, on balance look, I don't really care what it is. It's a decent shot, depending on now if it's you know Bobon taking a step back thirty two footer. Well, that probably goes in too because Bobon's a legend. But you know what I'm saying. <laughs> um, yeah, and look, the other thing is, I mean, they're down two. I, I'm pretty sure Luca wanted to go ahead and win that thing then, because like we said, he's a game time decision on a bum ankle. And not only did he play, not only did he produce these crazy numbers, he played the most minutes that he's played in any NBA game. So I, I don't think five more minutes is is something that the Mavericks necessarily wanted at that point. Um, this dude is absolutely incredible. I mean, and and by the way, so this series has been so entertaining. The cumulative score after four games is Clippers plus one. Hmm. Um, 
much has been made of Dallas having the best offensive rating in the history of the NBA this season. Both of these teams are exceeding that through four games. It has been um, a lot of free throws, but low turnovers, low offensive rebounds. Basically like a first shot plus free throw series, like a clean half court series, middling pace, about what you would expect. And by the way, I think um, I think if I'm looking at it right, um, the broader story of the playoffs so far, this will change, is seven of the 16 teams in the playoffs midway through the first round are scoring above Dallas's regular season number. The wow. offenses are absolutely out of control. And, you know, it's like the, the announce crew was talking about it, you know, different ways to, to stop Luka. And we can talk about that. You know, should they come up to the level of the screen? Should they trap him? Should they blitz him? through? The, should they throw foreign objects at him from the bench? Um, I, the Clippers can't stop uh, – the Mavericks can't stop the Clippers either. And, and I just – this played out – I mean, in, in my podcast preview, I said, you know, this might be a series in which the Mavericks' chance to win is just to outscore the Clippers. And, and like, yeah. I don't know that either of these teams are going to have an awesome answer. These offenses are just so good that I, I I don't really know what the answer is. Do you see, Like, if you're the Clippers, I mean, I know they're spitballing 25 different things. Do, do any of them look attractive to you? Well, getting Pat Beverly back, I think, is their best chance. But I don't know if that's happening. Uh, you know, the, the, obviously this calf has been something that's been bothering him, uh, you know, for, for a while now. And I, I will see if he's able to go in this series. But, uh, you know, obviously the more Pat Beverly you have, the less Reggie Jackson you have. And I think that would be a, a big a big boost to the Clippers defense. And it's funny, you know, the, the Mavericks made – Rick Carlisle made a major adjustment to improve their defense going into this where – you talk about the best offense in NBA history statistically. Their best lineup with Seth Curry, you know, plugged in and and them playing small with Porzingis as a lone big. They went away from that this series because they wanted Maxi Kleba guarding Kawhi. And look, Kawhi is averaging thirty some odd. I mean, he's he's lighting it up. But all things considered, Maxi's actually done a a solid job on him. You look at the numbers with Maxi defending him versus everybody else, and it's you know. Okay, and whoa. <laughs> um, so, so I'm going to come out and say I don't believe those numbers. Um, like, I believe that they're real. I just yeah. don't believe that they indicate anything real. To me, Kawhi looks very comfortable in any matchup the Mavericks throw at him, including Maxi. He looks like he has a lot of space to get any mm-hmm. shot that he wants. And I think Rick felt that, too, because they started doubling him yeah. in the second half yesterday. And it worked. They got it, it didn't work when Marcus Morris hit a three to put them in the lead. But in general... It got the ball out of his hands. He committed a couple turnovers, or the Clippers committed a couple turnovers. You know, that's one. It, that, but people want to say, you know, the Clippers should double Luka. It's like, oh, okay, he, he's a top three passer on planet yeah. Earth. Like, I, I don't know that that's actually going to work. Yeah, do you want to double Luka and give up a clean three to, to Seth Curry or a clean three to Tim Hardaway, the two guys who, in in terms of high-volume catch-and-shoot three-point guys, they were the two most efficient dudes in the league. And that's one, because they can really shoot, and two, because Luka's (laughs) creating a lot of really, really good three-point looks for him. He gets in the lane, and he's, with a live dribble, just kind of turning a little bit this way and turning 10 degrees that way, and then all of a sudden, the ball is in the corner and someone's wide open, you're like, how the hell did he even see that? It's right. like what the passes he's throwing are like next, next, next level passes. They are Magic Johnson, Larry Bird, LeBron James level passes. Yeah, he, he throws passes that you don't see until they are be on the way there. You know, and I mean, like you said, he's, he's driving, he's in traffic, you know, he's jumping, he's leaning, he's kind of firing these little sidearm things, and next thing you know, you know, Seth Curry is 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 catching the ball cleanly in the shooter's pocket and, and going up and knocking it down. I mean, it's and then, you know, the the, the lob game that he has and uh, it, it's hard mask his ability to go up. You think he's shooting a floater. He's so good at finishing. Next thing you know, he just kind of dumps it off to to Porzingis or Cleaver, or whoever. Is finished. I mean, the guy is. It's part of the part insane. of. I think part of the answer is if there is an answer. And again, there may not be. But part of the answer that I would try if I were the Clippers is to whatever degree is possible without warping my offense. 
I need to make him look work a little harder on defense. And to Lucas' credit, he guarded Paul George some last night and guarded him well. Now, Paul George has absolutely <laughs> stunk up the joint this entire series. And the biggest adjustment the Clippers can make is to have Paul George not suck. So if I were to, if I were telling Doc Rivers what to do, I would say, Paul, have Paul George play better. He's 20 of 69 from the field. Yeah. Those are real numbers, 20 of 69. He has 61 points in four games. Seth Curry and Tim Hardaway Jr. have outscored him, and Trey Burke is close. Um, it's just not in his defense, by the way, very quietly has been like 10% mm. worse this season. It just, he yeah. hasn't quite been the same. Um, but um, it did, did, I, did Kawhi Leonard downgrade on co stars leaving Siakam to go to Paul George? I'm just asking. Wow. I'm, I mean, it's just a question. I just, I'm, I ask questions. I'm a reporter. I ask questions. Uh, no. Um, no, I don't think so. Uh, although I, I love, I, I you know, I love spicy P. A spicy P and playoff P. Two P's. <laughs> uh, yeah, spicy P. I think is living has, has lived up to his nickname. Playoff P, not so much. Yeah, playoff you know, the, P. Playoff P is like lowercase P until yeah, until playoff, further notice. Paul, problem. by the way, I love Paul George. Paul George is a boss. Paul George is going to show up. He just has to show up now. It's too too. Yeah. Like, it's it's got to be now. Better get there quick. You know, and and one thing that's. With Luka, he is versatile enough defensively that the Mavericks can pick different matchups to try to hide him on, if that makes sense. You know, he can guard several different positions. You just want him to have the, the least challenge in defensive assignment. Right now, they can hide him on Paul George. <laughs> well, for the most part, they have put him on Marcus Morris. And I just think... Even if it's like you don't want to have Marcus Morris become like one of the focal points of your offense, really. But the Clippers, for as good as their offense is, and these are the two best offensive teams in the NBA, they can get a little aimless on offense. And I thought Paul George had a couple of shots um, late in the game, one in the fourth quarter, one in overtime, or maybe one in the third, one in the fourth, where the possession was just kind of like Paul George dribbles around and shoots a 20-footer. On one of them, he had he's in no kind of rhythm, obviously. Yeah, and one of them, he had Kawhi set a screen for him to get a switch of a a worse defender into Dorian Finney-Smith, a much better defender, and then he like jacked a twenty footer over. It's like, what are you doing? Yeah, thank you. I would like to see the Clippers just like give me Doc is a great play design guy. Like there can't be such a big gap between the out of time out plays and everything else in terms of how much activity is going on. Give me like Marcus Morris sets a ball screen and then pops off a flare screen. Give me like a pick and roll into a pin down for Paul George. Like something. Give me like Marcus Morris screens for Kawhi and then sets a pin down. Just give me like a little juice. And it's so easy to not do that because Kawhi is so freaking good that all you have to do is give him the ball. But like they just need a little more. Sometimes they could use a little more purpose. And if a a, a downstream effect of that is that Luca has to run around a little bit more on yeah. defense, like I'm all in for that. Yeah, yeah, and you know, look, the other thing that the Clippers are missing in this series is the guy who's going to be the sixth man of the year. I mean, Montrez Harrell has been n- not a non-factor, but a negative factor for the Clippers, and it's understandable. I mean, the guy missed all the seeding schedule. You know, his, his grandmother passed away. He wasn't. He was out of the bubble. You know, obviously for tragic family reasons. Um, so this is a guy who is trying to chip off five plus months of rust in a playoff series. Um, I'm sure he doesn't have, you know, feel like he has his legs, his rhythm, his conditioning. And so, you know, this dude who was the, I mean, I think he's going to be the sixth man of the year. I think he should be, is basically is just giving the Clippers abs- not only absolutely nothing, but he's getting beat up on the other end by Boban. Boban's had a nice little series. Yeah, and and you would think Montrez is going to more than – you know, more than make the Mavs pay for playing Boban on, you know, with his offense as a pick and roll guy, as, as, you know, with the ability to face up an attack, he's just not there right now. And so, you know, Boban's a foot taller than him. He's just, you know, can jump hook him or that little funky looking turn around all that, you know, and it's, I guess, so they don't have their, their, you know, perennial all-star because Paul George hasn't showed up. They don't have, the guy who's going to be the sixth man of the year because Montrez Harrell isn't there, and so here it is. You know, they're there, and, and you know what? The Clippers, when when Doc Rivers is coming out post game talking about, you know, he felt like they were, I think, emotionally weak. Was that was was his? Yeah, words? Doc wasn't messing around yesterday. 
I mean, they're... Uh, hey, by I, the way, you know what the Mavericks rattled. have to say to do this? Like, we don't have this, we don't have that. Cry me a freaking river. Chris oh, no Porzingis question. didn't play game four. He got ejected from game mm-hmm. two, game to game one, on a absolutely bogus double, two technicals. Um, Jalen Brunson's hurt. Dwight Powell's hurt. Our benches and tathers, but we're making it work. You know what? We're making it work with a guy we just picked up in Trey Burke. Seth Curry's balling. We're finding minutes for Boban, and, and he's not getting us killed defensively. In fact, he's producing offensively. Like, we're making it work. Cry me a river about Pat Beverly. Oh, no. There's there's no sympathy. There's no sympathy for sure. But, uh, you know, if we're talking about reasons why, yeah, let's be honest. We thought the Clippers would probably coast in this series. And I know going into the bubble, you know, people asked me about the Mavericks. I said, I think the Mavericks are a real threat to make a run if they don't have to face the Clippers in the first round. I, I didn't think they can make this series competitive, but shows what I know. Um, there is no capital A answer to Luka. He's too good, and the Mavericks have too much shooting around him. The best players, there is no scheme. There's just you gotta be. You either have a, an elite defender, and even that hasn't proven to be enough, um, you know, for for the Clippers. Or you just mix up a lot of stuff. So like double Luca, you might buy yourself four minutes of Tim Hardaway Jr. randomly missing open threes, or right. like a couple blown layups or something. That's all you're gonna buy. You got to do that and then do something else. I think the closest thing there is to me is. A combination of everything, by which I mean, like, I, I think they did stumble upon something with Marcus Morris at center late in the game, in game four. And just as much as you can switch, because yeah. he is just eating up your big men on the pick and roll. He's eating them alive no matter what they do. As soon as he sees it once, the second time he solves it. He's just eating them for dinner and lunch and breakfast. Um, so the switching, yeah, look, you're going to have Reggie Jackson on him. That's bad. You're gonna have Lou Williams on him. That's that's bad. Like, that's worse. You know, even, even when Pat Bev is in the game, like there's still gonna be someone who is on him. Where you're like, he can beat this dude one on one. Well, let's so, be honest. He's too big for Pat Bev. Pat Bev likes the bigger guys, but yeah, he's too big for Pat. He, Bev. Pat, he, Pat he don't like Luca. Um, don't mess with Luca. Don't get under his skin. Um, don't try to. Um, so so you switch, and then to me, there's a difference between. Just doubling, doubling, double, 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 and like switch and then send the double late in the shot clock where all he's got left in him is one pass, right? Like that, that's, Mm -hmm. that is like, then you're sort of, you're dictating the terms of engagement, but you're also using the shot clock as your friend and as your extra teammate. That's like, like Nick Nurse has found a way where like against all of these elite offenses, the Raptors are dictating the terms of engagement. And and the penalty for that is they're giving up a lot of threes, but they're giving up threes to people that they would rather have beat them, and they're making them shoot it against the shot clock. And it's really hard to do that. It's really, really hard to do that. And that's why I say I don't think there's one scheme. I think it has to be a combination of everything. And guess what? Even that's not going to work for, like, an entire quarter, an entire half. You're just you're just going to pray to the basketball gods that those dudes miss shots. Yeah, and, and you know, Doc's whole thing all series long has been, hey, I can live with Luca lighting it up as a scorer. We can't let him have both. We can't let him, you know, score 43 and dish out 13 assists. But like you said, it, it's easier said than done when a guy is that big, that smart, and that skilled. And, and, and the skill to me, like the step back, again, I think that's the shot you want him taking. And you'll and you'll live with the the odds and the percentages, but he's just so skilled as a finisher in the lane around the basket. It's, he's not obviously and, some crazy explosive leaper, but dude, you look at his finishing numbers; he is absolutely elite because he gets where he wants to go, and he's just so crafty in there. You nailed it. That's the most important thing that happened this season for Luka Doncic. That is the biggest driver of his ascendancy from All Star to MVP level player mm-hmm. is his finishing in the lane. These bigger guys have no shot. Like just not, he just goes through them, around them, gets them off balance, left right handed, left handed, off the glass, not off the glass. He has every possible finish in the lane. And these dudes don't have a chance. He never dunks. I no, like I can't very, even picture very. as he dunked all, like I'm sure he's dunked. I just I can't I cannot close my eyes and picture Luka Doncic dunking. Yeah, every once in a while, put it this way, when he dunks, it's still a, ooh, whoa, a, a Luka dunk. They're like, you know, a special little treat. 
but he's just so good at getting in there, using his body, kind of twisting and contorting and, you know, just like you said, little floaters, little off the glass, whatever. I mean, from all different angles. And, and you know, and also part of it is, look, the big question about Luca coming in to the league was, can he be in shape? You know, is he going to be athletic enough to, to be a superstar? Everybody, he's, everybody knew he was going to be good. Will, would he be athletic enough to be a superstar? And to his credit, he has worked on his body. He worked hard last summer. He worked hard during, you know, this hiatus when he was back in he's, in Slovenia. He's better now than he was in March. I don't know what he did between March and now, but he wasn't. I mean, he was awesome in February, March. He, th- this is a better player. Well, he treated it, he treated it like another off season, and you know, he did. And look, the other thing is, he was beat to hell in March. I mean, he'd sprained that right ankle That's twice. Right. He had a sprained thumb. He had a sprained wrist. And so I think he was one of the guys who benefited most. And then, of course, you know, he sprains his left ankle, and <laughs> he's still able to go out and put up a historic triple-double. But, you know, all things considered, he was really beat up. And I think the time away, the time to heal, and then the time to continue working on his body. And it's not like, look, he's never going to be in a dunk contest, obviously. But he's just that much quicker. And, and you know, and, and he's so good at being able to kind of – change speeds and slow it down but once he's quick enough to get guys on his hip or on his back and once that happens forget it i mean there's dude there was a play yesterday where he's got Kawhi leonard on his back and it's just like you know let me give you a piggyback ride little fella that's Kawhi leonard well he's and the level of problem solving is unbelievable and this is why it's like the, there is no one answer so there was a possession late in the third quarter where marcus morris was on him and Kawhi was on um, whoever was screening for him, I think mm-hmm. Kleba. Um, and he knew they were going to switch because that's what the Clippers are doing. And so he faked towards the pick and like triggered the switch and then w- rejected it and went the other way and either yeah. got a layup or a foul. I, I can't remember. Um, like he has all, he's got every counter for what you're doing. And when he knows what you're going to do beforehand, he's got four different counters that he can kind of pick from. My favorite pass that he threw was just a little itty bitty one early in the game. He got Zubats on a switch, and poor Zubats in those scenarios. It, it just hasn't gone very well. Um, and and the Mavericks, to their credit, are not messing around. Anytime Zubats is stuck on Porzingis or Kleba, whoever is the center screener, yeah. they are going right to Luca pick and roll. They're not messing around. So Zubats is on him, and Zubats drops back, and Luca pulls the ball out, and Luca out of the corner of his eye sees Paul George guarding Trey Burke, kind of looking at him in, in the left corner, right next to Luca, And uh, he takes a dribble back like he's going to shoot a three. Paul George lunges at him, and he just throws this little side sidearm yeah. pass to Trey Burke for a corner three. I'm like, man, that was mean. He just manipulated poor Paul George and got Trey Burke a corner three like that. It was awesome. Well, it's like Rick Carlisle said. He sees the game in 6G. Forget about 5G. He sees it at a, at a different level. And, you know, that's look, when people make – the bird, the magic comparisons, even the LeBron comparisons. That's that's what you're talking about. Just the way that these guys not only see see the floor and see you know all their teammates and all the defenders, but see what the next, you know, what the next move is going to be and just pick it apart. Well, my favorite thing about him has always been how good he is in little in between moments like that. Like there are some guys who they commandeer the offense. They have the ball. They run a pick and roll. I know all my reads off of that corner shoot over here, lob, dunk, kick out, blah, blah, blah. And they don't have the same ability when the game is kind of in flux, when it's a little muddy, right? Like when the yeah. when it's clear cut, they know how to do everything. It's great. Luca has always had this little, like those little in-between moments. He's like a really clever give and go player. Like he'll pick up his dribble, hand it over here. He, he and DJ actually had a nice chemistry with that last year. And he'll cut to the rim. He's just a very smart intuitive in the moment kind of player and like he problem solves everything you know I, I talked about this in game three there were a couple possessions early when Zubats got switched on to him and he dribbled out like he was going to take a step back three and the Clippers use that as an opportunity to switch again bring somebody from the wing like you're above the three-point arc we're going to bring the guy next to you and switch Zubats out he saw that once and was like, all right, I'm not doing that again. When I see yeah. Zubats, I'm just driving at him and I'm laying it up. Like he sees it once, and he he um, he picks it apart. I just 
you know, we'll see. I, I just don't. I mean, you want to talk about adjustments? It's like your adjustment might just be be better on offense. Like <laughs> the adjustment for these teams might have, be, be even better. Have, on yeah, offense. have Paul George hit some shots. I would like to see Marcus Morris. They're getting away with like Seth Curry on Marcus Morris a lot. And if I'm going to use Marcus Morris on offense, it's in those moments where he has like a six inch, fifty pound height advantage yeah. or whatever height and weight advantage. I'd like to see them do that a little bit more. Um, well, but, but to your point, if if the Clippers decide that hey, let, let's just feed Marcus Morris and and have him try to play bully ball, I think the Mavericks are okay with Kawhi Leonard standing on the other, you know, standing on the wing and watching that. Yeah, just just so just here and there, uh, particularly if Kawhi is on the bench, right? Like if if mm-hmm. it's the Paul George only minutes and they're getting that matchup, which in some cases it is, um, then go to that. I thought Kawhi. Kawhi pick and rolls with their smaller players started to get a little momentum. He started to find some comfort zones with that in games three and four. That'll be interesting. But look, if Paul George starts to play well, the Clippers are better. But yeah. I think I picked Clippers in six. Maybe I got really aggressive and picked five. But I, I think, thought that I thought that it would be a very competitive series. And yeah, in, the I, games I, would I, be tough. I'd go Clippers in six, but I'll be honest with you. I kind of gave the hometown uh, extra game factor in there just because I didn't want to hear any crap from the Mavericks. <laughs> Can we talk for... Um, <laughs> it's amazing that we hear crap for playoff picks. Uh, it really is. Um, well, I also picked Thunder in seven and I'm sure that... <laughs> yeah, I'm sure my friends in Houston will remind me of that if the Rockets are able to... Hey, to that series has been off. a lot of fun. The only reason I'm not talking about that on this podcast is the game tips off in two hours. There's no point yeah. in analyzing what's happened. Uh, let's talk for five minutes about Donovan Mitchell because we just have to. That guy... Now, again, the Nuggets' defense has been absolutely atrocious. Yeah. Mike Malone, poor Mike Malone is just playing whack-a-mole with these matchups. Can you, you guard that guy? Okay, oh, you can't guard that guy. You guard that guy. Oh, you can't guard that guy. Okay, can you guard the vending guy? Like, we can't, we can't hide everybody that we need to hide in hiding places. But Donovan Mitchell is making everything. Threes, floaters, layups, abusing Michael Porter, abusing Nikola Jokic, getting any matchup he wants, and... I, I, he's averaging forty, I think, yeah. <laughs> right now. And, um, and and look at the efficiency. I mean, you know, last year against the Rockets, he averaged like twenty one or whatever, but he he shot thirty two percent from the floor. I mean, it was awful. It was a terrible series for him, dude. This guy, I, I'm not looking at the numbers right now, but he's got to be shooting about sixty percent in the series, and he's lighting it up from three. Fifty six percent, fifty one percent from three. Right, and he's just. It's the the pick and roll, and you know, everyone's worried about the Gobert uh, Donovan chemistry. <laughs> the chemistry looks pretty good right now. Gobert and, has been incre- like very quietly. Gobert is having an incredible series. Yeah, and it's it's funny because, um, you know, I mean, Gobert just sets these left tackle type of screens, and Donovan's just walking into these threes. Boom, boom, boom. But even just walking into him to shoot fifty one percent from three, my God. And, you know, so Donovan's got two 50-plus point games in this series. You know, that's something only Jordan Iverson had done in a single series before. In some ways, though, I thought that his game, what was it? Was it game two or three? The 30-point 30, 30 game when he had 30 and 8, um, but he had 30 and 8 on uh, like 14 field goal attempts. I thought that might have been his most impressive game just because – He's not out there just hunting shots. He is making all the right reads, and that you know that's a game where you know they basically. Uh, I, th- I think the Nuggets decide, okay, hey, we're not going to let Donovan Mitchell kill us. And next thing you know, it's just lob Rudy, lob Rudy, lob Rudy, lob Rudy, and they just you know, like you said, no matter what Malone's trying, <laughs> they just don't have any hope against Donovan right now. Well, and Malone has tried everything. Um, in game four, he settled on, we're just going to have Jokic hang back in the paint and try to help a little bit less off their shooters. That didn't work. Um, you know, he's tried switching. That's a disaster. He's yeah. tried. Um, one thing they have to do is they're just conceding. Denver is just giving up these switches without any kind of fight at all. Like, Mike Conley just runs by Donovan Mitchell, and they switch, you right. know, Monte Morris onto him. Uh, Joe Ingles just jogs in the general vicinity of Donovan Mitchell, and they switch Michael Porter Jr. onto him. Like they have to, and they had started to do it toward the end of Game Four. They have to try to hedge or trap, and like Michael Porter can't really do those things very well. But you have to try. You can't just give up these switches. Um, but Mitchell, and he threw a couple. He's thrown several. His passing is better. His passing is really improved. Yeah. He threw a couple passes last night where instead of 
the pass he he threw the pass that was like one link in the chain ahead of where you right. would normally throw it a couple of times and like early he saw it early and I was like ooh this guy is like there's a little bit of a leap in progress here this is sure. this is like big 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 stuff yeah and and by the way that's what we're also seeing is why Johnny Bryant you know got that associate head coach job with the New York Knicks because Johnny Bryant has done a spectacular job overseeing. Uh, Donovan Mitchell's development, and you look when when you're evaluating Donovan Mitchell, you have to kind of keep the big picture in context, and that is this guy was primarily a baseball player until about the age of 16. He was a bench player as a freshman at Louisville. He had one year as a go-to guy at Louisville, and by the way, his offensive responsibilities increased significantly from his sophomore year in college to his rookie year in the NBA. That doesn't happen. And so Donovan is, you know, he he arrived in the NBA very raw. And for him to be that raw and to be able to be a go-to guy on a playoff team right off the bat is remarkable. But what we're seeing is just him take, you know, steadily progressing as a playmaker. And, you know, like you said, it, it looks like the, kind of the steady progress has taken a, a quantum leap. And, if he's going to shoot the threes that well, I don't know what you do with a guy who's that good off the dribble and is seeing the floor the way he's seeing it right now. A guy I'm also happy for is Mike Conley, who yeah. came back to the bubble and has played really well. And well, took he got a lot that, of, he got that Fred Van Vliet, you know, newborn baby boost. Well, he he's got that. There's nothing. There there can't be very many things of being like a new father, but not having to have the sleep deprivation. Like I know I have a new kid. <laughs> He's probably really cute. Or yeah. I can't remember if he's a boy get, or a girl. Get to, get really your, cute. Getting FaceTime. Now I'm going to go to bed and get like nine hours of sleep. Uh, yeah, get uh, to watch the diaper changing on FaceTime. Oh, I wish I was there. But he's had he had a rough start to the season. He had Utah fans like constructing fake trades, attaching picks to get rid of him, this, that, and the other thing. Um, he's had some bad injuries and in playoffs past, you know, and like he's just rolling right now. He's comfortable, and that's been fun. And how weird is Joe Ingles? Or he can score two points combined over two games, and you think like he played pretty well. Like, I, yeah. like I, I don't have a huge problem with Joe Ingles scoring two points in two games. Yeah, I remember uh, at, there was some point fairly late in last night's game. I'm just scanning the box score, and it's like Joe Ingles is scoreless with one assist, and he's plus eleven at the time. <laughs> Thirty five minutes, zero for four, I think. One did he have one point? No, I had no points. Yeah, had no points. Um, yeah, Mitchell has been unbelievable. Um, Tony Bradley's playing well off the bench for them. Royce O'Neal's playing well. Like they're just Jordan yeah, Clarkson's is, playing well. And that I mean, look, they had to woo. completely reconstruct their bench on the fly. But I, I didn't think the Jazz were going to win a first round series. But as soon as Bogdanovich went down, I was like, the Jazz are they're they're screwed. Now and, and, to, and to be fair, Denver is missing two guys who were starters. And yeah, give them some semblance of two way play, and they have. I mean, Jeremy Grant has probably been their closest thing to a two way player in this series. Every yeah. move they make is a trade-off between shooting and defense. And, um, you know, long-term, they got to figure out, can they ever defend even average with Murray, Porter, and Jokic on the floor? Because Jokic has been bad. It's not all his fault because the guys guarding the ball handlers are falling way behind these picks and getting killed and leaving too much space. Murray's going to top out as okay. Porter has been hmm. Porter has been so bad. Hmm. That it flirts with like unplayable against starters, and that's the conclusion Michael Malone came to. Is like, I just yeah. can't play you against their best lineups. You have to come off the bench. I mean, you're, we're seeing why, despite the obvious talent and skill, he didn't play a whole lot this year. And you know, I mean, honestly, if 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 Michael Porter's not, uh, you know, if he didn't have the back injuries, he'd have been a top two or three pick, and he'd you know he'd be lighting it up for a lottery team right now. But he goes, he you know, he goes where he went. And he ends up landing on a playoff team, and it's it's, you know, it's tough to prioritize the development of a, a young dude, even that talented, when you know you're you're trying to win playoff games and playoff series. And again, Denver's banged up. Jokic had the coronavirus. You just don't know how to evaluate. They're playing in a bubble. Yeah, you just don't know how to evaluate these things. But it's been a bad series. All right, Tim McMahon wrote a great piece on Luka's game last night. What else you got in the works? What can we look forward to? Oh, we got more Luka stuff coming up. Old Pelton and I are comboing on a uh, on a Luka comp piece. 
And as you know, when, when you talk about Luca, everybody wants to talk about the, the, all the legends that he reminds them of. So we're working on a little something there. You and Pelton, that's an odd couple. I like that. I like that. Yeah, usually, usually I like to work with people a little bit more intelligent, but I'm going you know, to play dumb on this one. I was going to say, I, I would imagine I can see you making fun of Pelton frequently in your collaboration, which makes me happy. All right, Tim McMahon, all your work is awesome. It's good to see you. Stay safe down there in the heartland. And uh, hopefully, like I said last time, I'd love to drink a beer at some point in L.A. or one of our annual meetings before 2023. We'll get there, brother. Thanks, bud. Appreciate you having me. Okay, let's welcome in friend of the program, Yaron Weitzman, author of Tanking to the Top, the Philadelphia 76ers, and the most audacious process in the history of professional sports. And Yaron is also a Bleacher Report and wrote a little autopsy on the 76ers' disastrous sweep uh, this morning. How are you, Yaron? I'm okay, Zach. I'm okay. Hang so, in. So hanging in, exactly. So today's my birthday. And for my birthday, for my birthday, I get three things, okay? <laughs> yeah. Number one... I get a hundred hugs from my daughter. That was I negotiated that. I, I think I have ninety-seven remaining. Uh, number two, I get to order Indian food tonight. Like number it. three, I get to talk about the Sixers on my podcast. That's the third thing I get to say. And let me open by saying this: I see a lot of people throwing dirt on the Sixers today. Okay, <laughs> burying the Sixers, talking about what a disaster the offseason was. And some of those people, eight months ago, whenever we were doing this, picked this same team to go very, very far in the playoffs, and in some cases, all the way in the playoffs. And so my thing is, you can't trash the roster as a disaster if 10 10 months ago you picked them to win the title. Or you can, because it turned out to be a disaster, but you must acknowledge that you fell for the disaster. So I will open this by acknowledging that I picked the Philadelphia 76ers to advance to the NBA Finals this season and lose to the Los Angeles Clippers. I completely misread this team. Uh, And it's funny, I actually listened to a podcast I recorded with Jay Williams uh, on July 2nd after Jimmy Butler left for Miami, Josh Richardson in, Al Horford in, J.J. Redick out. Um, And some of the things I said on that podcast were, quote, Who's creating for this team off the dribble and crunch? <laughs> People are making Al Horford out to be Dirk Nowitzki, and he's not. Tobias Harris is a below average passer. Tobias Harris guarding small forwards scares me. I think with their offense, they should rank about where they did this past season, which was 11th. And yet, and yet, having said all of that, what I fell for was A, their defense. I thought they could be a historically great defense. They were not, they were not close. And B, I fell for, and I will admit, I, I, I fetishized defense a little bit. I fell for the idea that this team with its defense and its size was, quote, built for the playoffs. They fell for that idea too. And it turns out built for the playoffs in 2020, which I knew and should have known and should have reminded myself as the Clippers and the Mavericks and the Jazz and all these other teams are reminding us is about shooting and spacing and ball handling and not not size and defense unless you're going to have a historically great defense. So do not bury the Sixers as a disaster if you thought this team was going to be good. And I thought they were going to be good. Um, That said, this is an absolute disaster. Um, And I just, I mean, we can start in a million different places. You wrote a book about this team. What is the, what is, what is this sweep made you reflect on? That's a good question. Um, one of the things I've struggled with most in doing this, and like you said, I wrote a piece and I struggled with this in the piece, it's there's so much context required and that goes into analyzing everything that went wrong here. Like it's not just Brett Brown's fault and it's not just the front office. And to understand why the front office, why this front office is in place and why they made their mistakes, you have to go back to Colangelo and then what happened in the wake of him and then Hinky and why that all went wrong and how ownership acts. And there's just a million different things. I think... Um, I think Mike Levin, our mutual friend, the right Ricky Sanchez guys, when I was on that podcast, he called it a, uh, he's like, this is a book of context. And I find, I thought that was pretty good. So in terms of struggling, it's just how do, how do you unpack, how do you unpack who's to blame or where blame properly lies here when what we're seeing, I think, is a culmination of years of mishaps. There are three pivot points to me mm-hmm. in how we arrived here. 
The number one and most important one is the selection of Markel Fultz with the number one pick in 2017. Yep. Um, for which they traded a future pick from the Kings, which was a very valuable trade asset that turned out to be less valuable um, than people thought. And of course, the number three pick, which was used on Jason Tatum. If Markel Fultz is good, none of everything stops there. If Markel Fultz is what everyone expected, there is probably no Jimmy Butler trade. There is just none of this madness that has engulfed the team occurs. Um, the second pivot point is giving up two first round picks in Landry Shamit for Tobias Harris, which is a, uh, Tobias Harris is fine. He's a, a, an okay to good player, a wonderful teammate. Mm-hmm. As we saw in game four, competitive is all hell and just not good enough to make 35 to $40 million a year. Just doesn't pass, doesn't get to the free throw line, doesn't shoot enough threes, blah, blah, blah. We all know. And the third pivot point is deciding to move off a of Butler. And that is, is the one that I think, although I said on that July 2nd podcast, who's creating off the dribble in crunch time, that's the one that I think in getting swept up in what this team could be defensively, that's the one that I underestimated. Because I think Jimmy Butler actually fit with this team pretty damn well. And that decision, and to replace him with Josh Richardson, who's good, and Al Horford, who is good but is not a fit on this team, um is ultimately one that I think was wrong and that they will regret. So pick any one of those three pivot points. Uh, let's <laughs> let, you know what? Let's start with Butler. Sure. Um, I don't know. I don't even know. Like, the the like why? Why did they do it? Uh, what's your read on why they, why they went that direction? So it's really complicated to answer. And like you and I were talking a little before, right? There are all these different um, reports that have come out on different things. And obviously people have different agendas. I think there are, or I should say more than I think, my read on it is that there are a few reasons. Um, one, and it goes back to the column you wrote last year on, um, and this isn't the first reason but, or the primary reason, but the Ben Simmons stuff I think was a real thing. Um, I forget, what was the quote? What did Ben say to you about the dunker spot last year in the playoffs? He said, I definitely don't think that that's my role. Basically, definitely right. don't, I think, was in the quote. And as I've said on this podcast, when I asked him that question, his eyes lit up when he looked at me as if to say, look at my eyes. Right. My words will only say so much. Look at my eyes. <laughs> and, his, and his eyes said, thanks for asking. I'm not happy. <laughs> Yeah, I think I think that part of it has been underplayed a bit in terms of the retelling of why Jimmy Butler is no longer here. The issues that that would have created if um, Butler remained and the idea being that if he's running the half-court offense the way he had in the playoffs, right? The way Brett Brown took the ball out of Ben Simmons' hands and as most people would say, correctly so. Um, that was one of Brett Brown's better moves as a coach. Um, there's that. They over panic to the no backup center thing. Um, the idea that I forget the numbers, maybe you know them by heart. There's something ridiculous when he was off the floor, uh, when Embiid was off the floor against Toronto. The- I think it's minus right. 99. <laughs> something ridiculous. Um, it's like minus when the score in Space Jam, it when when the when monsters are is, is just like moving <laughs> yeah. up really fast. It's like minus that. So there's that. They overpanicked that. They they figured they assumed Embiid would be missing about 20 games. So they figured between those 20 games, and I'm not saying this is the correct thinking, but I believe this is what they were thinking. So that between the 20 games that Embiid would miss and then the backup minutes that they needed at center, Horford would be good there. They figured Horford could do some a decent job um, guarding Giannis Antetokounmpo. Um, Brett Brown, the whole Brett Brown Jimmy relationship is pretty well. I mean, I wrote about it in the book, but it's been you don't even need my book anymore to tell us about that. There are plenty of quotes from either of them that tell us all we needed to know about how they got along. Um, this part's complicated because so Brett ver- made very clear throughout the year that he was not happy with or he was frustrated, I should say, by Butler and coaching Butler, and he wouldn't be the first coach to say so. Um, but my, you know, my, I wrote today that in the end, he made clear that he was okay with Butler coming back, that he could coach Butler. That doesn't mean necessarily that the Sixers thought that partnership could work. That's the other part of it. That's, right? an, important, that's an important distinction. So in your right. book, so yes. you wrote today mm-hmm. that he was okay ultimately with it. Now, when you put it that way, it's like it sounds like it's like, I'm okay eating my cauliflower, I guess, after dinner or like with my, like, I'm okay with it. I'm not psyched about it. And as you said, the higher ups may have thought, well, I don't want 
a dynamic where my coach thinks of Jimmy Butler as the cauliflower with his dinner. I and the opposite that. should be said. Butler was not a fan of yeah, Brown either. Yeah, exactly. like, I, like I don't want a dynamic. Maybe the I'm saying maybe the front office thought this. I think they did, frankly. No matter what Brett Brown said in the end, yes or no, I think the front office and the ownership thought, well, I'm not sure we want a dynamic here where one of our stars and our coach are sort of holding their nose to coexist mm-hmm. together. And I, I think that's just something we don't want to live with. Um because in your book, you said Brown lobbied against yep. the re-signing of Butler. Um, and I think just that that discrepancy points to like, I, the truth is very, is often buried underneath these semantics of, did you want him or did you want him, want him? You know what I mean? It's like, it's a very hard thing to figure out. In the end, I think the, the team just thought the Simmons stuff and the Brown stuff, it's just too, it's just too messy. It's too messy. Let's just, let's just not have it around anymore. Right. Is that fair? Yep. I would say that's fair. I would say that's fair. And I mean, it's, and I, you said it's Butler's a perfect fit. I think we've learned also, you know, you saying on the court, but I think off the court as difficult as he can be sometimes, um, I think he took a load off of Embiid and Simmons and he was able to do some locker room stuff. He had some fire to him in a way that those two do not. And I think, I mean, you see now how many times we heard him beat on different podcasts talk about how much he misses Jimmy Butler. Um, I do think they, yeah, I think they miss him. I think what what you said before about Horford resonates with me because I think the Sixers and and, and in reacting to their signings, me too, um, got caught up in matchups yes. and not and not team building. I think they had become obsessed with a who gives Giannis trouble. And B, who gives Embiid trouble? And in Horford, they found they felt they found an answer to both of those questions. And what ended up happening in the Eastern Conference is, and I think they probably knew Kawhi was leaving. And so they didn't necessarily concern themselves with the Raptors. Uh, and what happened was the Raptors stayed awesome. The Celtics got awesome. And the Bucks were the Bucks. And all of a sudden, I, I actually do think the Sixers fully healthy represented an interesting matchup for Milwaukee. They would have mm-hmm. been underdogs in this series, but I think I think they do have the personnel to bother the Milwaukee a little bit and have and have you know shown it here and there. Um, although Giannis has solved that Horford matchup, and frankly, it was clear. And I wrote this last year or said it. It was clear in the Celtics series last year that Giannis had grown comfortable attacking Horford. He had figured it out. And I just think they talked themselves into building a team that was too specifically designed yes. and not designed with a broad enough conception in mind. It's a, it's a very narrow way of looking at the league, right? That like nothing else is changing except the additions you made to your team. And I think that, I think that's one of, what happened. I think that's exactly what happened here. Um, the other thing is, so it seems an inevitability that Brett is not going to be the coach. Maybe even after we record this podcast, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> um, the other thing is that I found interesting and you mentioned Julian Butler and lighting a fire you know, there's been all of this noise for years and years that the the Sixers uh, that don't, don't have a culture of accountability on their team, that Joel can do whatever he wants yep. and Ben can do whatever he wants. Yep. And you have a lot of whatever they want examples in your book that I don't <laughs> want to spoil. Um, and that the root of some of that is that Brett Brown is an inherently very nice person who does not enjoy confronting other people in an g- aggressive or confrontational manner. And you have this anecdote in your book that I'm not going to spoil most of the best anecdotes in your books, but I'm going to spoil two. Spoil <laughs> this, is, this is the first one. Um, you have an anecdote in here, and of course I have my book on the wrong freaking page, but it's essentially about, I want you to describe it. It's essentially the team holding an in, what amounts to an intervention for Brett Brown about okay. Joel Embiid. Can you describe yeah. this, please? Sure. This, by the way, this has not been reported anywhere as far as I know, and I want to congratulate you because one of the difficulties of writing a book about a team that has been covered to this degree is the burden of finding stuff that is new. And you found a lot of stuff that is new, including this. That's really hard. Congratulations. Tell Well, the thank story. you, Zach. Yeah, the story. So Embiid, this is Embiid's first year, I guess, do we call it his rookie? I don't know, first year. I won't say his rookie year. It's his first year with the team. Um, and again, context is important. That year, I forget, I'm going to get some of the timeline off, but he finds out, he's out for the year with the injury, and he finds out his brother, I believe he was 13 years old, is tragically killed back in Cameroon in an accident. Um, that wrecks Embiid, as it would anyone, right? So again, the context of this stuff and why it's so hard to analyze it all in a bubble. Um, Embiid comes back. He's, I think he would later even describe himself as depressed. Um, he's dealing with that. He's not playing. His weight's ballooning. He's not, and these stories were at, 
documented before, some of the not training, getting in arguments with um, strength coaches, some of his um, eating habits, the Shirley Temples, things like that. He's giving everyone lots of problems to the extent that at one point in bead, uh, middle of the year, um, I think this was after, I believe it was after he was sent home for the argument with the strength coach. Um, Brett Brown is pulled into a room and there are dozens of team staffers, from, you know, coaches, strength coaches, all that stuff. Um, basically someone gets up and says, coach, we're here because Joel's giving us all a problem and there's nothing, you know, we need to do something about it. And Brett starts yelling. He gets upset at his chief of staff, um, assistant coach, Billy Lang, um, uh, who now is in, uh, St. Joseph's, I believe. Um, yeah. He uh, yells at him. There's some expletives. Brett likes to throw some expletives around every now and then, uh, or more than every now and then. Um, why didn't I know about this? Uh, how come no one told me? This has to stop. And they're saying they did tell him. And I just think it was very telling of some of the problems that these things were going on. And either he didn't know about it, as he's saying, but if he's saying he doesn't know about it, I don't know if that's much better, to be honest, right? If As opposed to knowing about it, not doing anything about it. Like, I don't know which, which argument or which defense he wants to be lobbying for himself. And there are all sorts of stories like that. So again, the example is there's a reason Embiid's not just being a pain in the ass for the hell of it. There are genuine reasons why a kid, someone that young in that situation might be acting this way. But if you don't nip things in a bud early on and players become more powerful and they see them get away with things, anyone who's a parent knows this, right? It becomes really difficult to change that later on. Well, I'm, I'm tired of saying it. The Sixers aren't going where they should be able to. And I think par part, of our, part of my faith in the Sixers this year was Joel off playoff heartbreak and talking all about, I want to oh, be yeah. the third guy to win MVP and defensive player of the year is going to get in shape and stay in shape and play hard all the time. Did not happen. Uh, and B, Ben Simmons is going to shoot talking yeah. <laughs> three-pointers. Won a game. Did not happen. In fact, almost passive-aggressively mm -hmm. undermining the entire team. And by the way, Brett Brown's not the only one to go over to Ben Simmons and say, well, you shoot. I mean, many people on the team have been telling him this for years. That didn't happen either. And, and I'm tired of saying it, but they're not, they're not going where they can go as a duo until all of those things happen. And they did not happen this year. I was hopeful um, that they would. Uh, and, and I thought it was telling after yesterday's game, uh, the sweep game, that Josh Richardson said, you know, something to the effect of we need more. Brett's a nice guy. He said it out loud. No one said yeah. it out. No one has said it out loud before. Josh Richardson, who's been frustrated all year. And I mean, maybe not the best move for him personally in that locker room, but maybe that tells you what you want to know about what he expects coming up um no he no one said it out loud before you know it's been whispered and people hint at it and blah 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 but nobody has said it out loud like that he, he said it a couple times out loud this yep. year this one got attention because of the, the the context the sweep um he said you know we need accountability and i think it's it's um josh richardson comes from miami yep jimmy butler's in miami i i think that that's the sort of common denominator of the cultural difference between the two teams and the two coaching staffs and the tone that pat, pat riley has set um, from the top in Miami. Um, and, you know, I, 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 I don't think Brett has been a great playoff coach, although I will say, I think he actually held his own and maybe outcoached Nick Nurse last year in the conference semifinals. I think he coached a great series in that series. This series, I thought, and I said this last week, I thought game two was a really bad game. I thought it was a bad game for him personally. And if there was anybody on the fence in Philly, I think that game, it, it would have pushed them over the fence. Um, slow but, adjustments, some of the classic, like slow adjustments, not, prep, not prepared for the post offense, things like that, right? Some of the classic. Um, well, just the thing that drove me nuts when I was watching the game was just leaving Shake Milton out to die yeah. against Kemba Walker. And Kemba yeah. Walker is, I, I, I've already addressed it. It yeah. doesn't matter. Uh, but Brett Brown didn't draft Markel Fultz. Um, he didn't trade for Tobias Harris. Mm -hmm. And he didn't. Uh, sign Al Horford to a contract that is now so negative that the Sixers are going to have to incentivize teams to get off of it. And frankly, I sat there last night trying to find Al Horford trades and good <laughs> it's not easy. Um, so let's talk about Fultz. Sure. Because that's just, I mean, that's Greg Oden. I mean, that, that's just, you can't, that's unrecoverable. That's an organizational catastrophe that can set a team back for 10, 15 years. And the only reason it didn't is because Sam Hinkie had gotten them so many high picks. And by the way, I think Sam Hinkie's draft record is kind of overrated. Like, there's some there's some bad misses. Careful, Zach. Hinkie. They're going to come after you. Careful, careful. Well, no. Look, <laughs> Sam did a great job. I think Sam, is a, I think Sam ultimately put them in position where um, I don't think it was a layup 
to go from 50 wins to championship contention. People want to characterize it as a layup because they had so many assets. Let me say this. That is never a layup for anybody. No, unless that's the hard have, part. <laughs> unless you have LeBron James or Giannis or Luka or one of these transformational all-time great guys, and Embiid and Simmons are not at that level yet. Unless you have one of those guys, that's not a layup no matter how many sexy future draft picks you have. It's just not. No matter how much cap space you have, it's not. That's not a layup. But he put them in very good position to do it. Um, uh, but the Fultz, and the only reason, but I'm saying the f- only reason the Fultz pick isn't an organizational catastrophe that just destroys your team is because Embiid and Simmons are already there. Um, to my knowledge, and this is the second anecdote in your book that I'm going to spoil, um, you are the only person who has any on the record or even on background information about Markel Fultz's workout with the Boston Celtics, it, which was maybe the final straw in getting Boston to say, uh-oh, let's let's take the Tatum kid that we know a lot about because we have some Duke connections. <laughs> um, you have, uh, so here's what you say in your book, page 183, your own, if you need me to refresh your memory. Well, I was going to ask you, sometimes I'm forgetting when I use on the record or on background, so I was going to ask you to remind me if I'm quoting people there. <laughs> oh, you're quoting somebody by name, okay. my friend. There you go, okay. perfect. That's good, okay. Um, but, 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 but. And you talk about how Fultz struggled in his workout. And here is Keith Williams, a longtime Fultz mentor mentor Mm -hmm. and trainer, explaining why he struggled in his Boston workout. There was no music, the gym was quiet, and there were just all these older white men staring at him, said Keith Williams. He was nervous. The Celtics people have never spoken, not even off the record, about what happened in that workout. You got Keith Williams, his longtime family friend and associate, to say that which is, to say the least, an interesting quote. He also was not great in his Sixers workouts, correct, according to your book? Yeah, no, he was, uh, I think not great would be uh, overestimating it, right? He was pretty, he was pretty bad. Um, so let me ask you this. If I read your book and I read the fault section, and I have, my takeaway from all of your exhaustive reporting is that your own Weitzman thinks... In the end, this is just my takeaway. I'm not saying it's right. I'm saying this is what, as a reader, I came across to me. Yep. Your own Weitzman, who has a point of view, he's the author of the book, thinks that Markel Fultz had a mental breakdown, that that was the cause of what happened. Am I accurately portraying your ultimate conclusion? Let me uh, – <laughs> how about this? I wouldn't use the word mental breakdown. I guess I'll, I'll answer the question like this, right? I wrote the chapter – I did a lot of reporting on that, spoke to a lot of people, and I wrote it in the language I did and with for a specific reason. So I guess that maybe answers your question. Um, There are lots of things there. Here, I'll kind of I'm I'm evading a little bit purposely. That did not answer my question. I know I'm evading a little bit purposely just because you know you get you get once you get threatened a few times, you try to be careful with the uh, wording you use. Um, The stuff with his mother, I thought, was really telling in terms of telling his whole story. And I think that was maybe... And don't spoil that. There's a lot... People should buy this book if only for the Fultz chapter. That alone is worth it. So that's... So I guess what I would say is there there was a lot going on in his life that... And I know I'm being annoying here, but that's okay. That emotionally, I think, would made it a little difficult for him. I also think it's key to remember a key part of Fultz's background. And I compared this to Simmons, right? A lot of number one picks these days... They're kind of trained for the spotlight at the age of 11, 12, 13. They kind of come up as celebrities, Instagram, mixtapes, all that stuff. Fultz was playing JV basketball uh, as a sophomore still. So this happened really fast and really late for him, the whole being thrust into the spotlight. And just like we think about with child actors, I think when that happens, that can create um, sort of difficulties or tensions around a family, around for an, ind- for an individual. How's that? Fair. <laughs> Fair. Uh, there's a lot of stuff in there about my girl's mother. That chapter, you know, I had heard rumors about all that stuff, but some of it, not all of it. I had never been able to report it to the point where I felt comfortable writing it. You got there. And again, um, that is not easy to do. Um, so, I mean, look, that's why I think ultimately I'm not sure Brett is the only one that's going to that's going to um, if indeed what what everyone is thinking happens, happens to Brett. I'm not sure he's going to be the only casualty of this because those those are not his decisions. Those are mm-hmm. front office decisions. And I think Elton is safe. Elton Brand's option got picked up recently. I think Elton is sharp. I think everyone there is, you know, like, look, people in throwing around blame want to call people idiots and morons. Like, people, smart people make bad decisions. 
smart people make well-intended bad decisions. And I think that's what happened here. And I think some of those people who are holdovers of the Colangelo regime, and that's a whole other bottle of worms that we, <laughs> there's bottle of worms, can of worms, whatever, some container holding worms. Um, I want to add something also with the, with the whole front office in terms of criticism. I agree. I do think, you know, you do this all the time, right? You play the results. You know, there were a few bounces away last year, not from winning the championship. You don't know what happens, but that, they went for it last year. And I think plenty of fans would have been happy if uh, the same moves happened and they won a championship. So I just, again, you, and you know this, right? It's just people, we, we all lose perspective a little bit um, once the final result happens. Um. Yes, you do. And, I, and again, that's why I think if you're going to bury them today and you're going to say what a disaster this is and how these people are idiots and did this wrong and that wrong. Like if you're at ESPN, the average expert pick was 55 wins. They had the third most people picking the third biggest championship odds, according to our, all of our people, that dozens and dozens of them. If you're going to bury them today, you got to you got to cop to it. You got to cop to it if you were one of those people. And I was. Um, but the but the moves did not work. Um, the question, and, and, and also, by the way, you can't spare ownership here. No, um, absolutely Josh, not. Har- Josh Harris, David Blitzer, and in, in your book, David Heller, who is no longer part of the ownership group, were, have been active all along. And I actually think, um, I actually think what happens now is going to be very, very interesting because if there is regime change in the front office, that raises more possible. I think if Elton stays in power. My guess would be that Simmons and Embiid are still on the team next year. I think both Simmons and Embiid will, will probably be on the team, period. I, I, and I think that would be the right decision. For, it's too early to me. I think you give another coach and some exactly. roster tweaks and see what happens. But if there's regime change, to me, that opens the door a teensy bit. If only because, and this is back to ownership, these guys are private equity guys and they like to make trades. <laughs> and I think I think that mindset has permeated the whole organization in the time that they've been here. I mean, these guys trade a lot. They trade picks. They've sold picks for cash, which has been kind of an under underplayed thing. They've traded yes. like tons of trade. That Tobias Harris trade is like a fantasy basketball trade. They like to make trades. And I don't think that's just the front office. I think the ownership is just, it's a very transactional, hungry, fingers on the button kind of group. And they can be swayed ownership. And that's been a big thing with them. You know, if whoever is... <laughs> it was Doug Collins. It was Sam Hinkie. It was Jerry Colangelo. You know, it's just whoever it is, they they can be swayed or be beholden to these bigger personalities to come in and say, "This is how we're doing things. This is how I want to do things. This is why it makes sense." And it wasn't hard to see these questions coming. Like like I said, I said it on that July second podcast. I went to Philly in the fall to write a feature on the team. Part of the feature was about how they had pretty good chemistry early in the season, and they did. Mm-hmm. You even wrote in your book that before Game 7 of Raptors-Sixers, Joe and Ben had a yeah. nice conversation. And yeah, I was had, there, yeah. Yeah, they had really kind of thawed. Their relationship had kind of improved. And Tobias Harris in that story said to be something interesting. He basically said, all that good chemistry stuff is cool when you're winning. The real test is going to come when we get some adversity. What does your culture look like when you have a five-game losing streak? And the answer to that question was bad. It falls apart. Yeah, poop, right? That's what I was going to say. It's uh, And again, not to be the dead horse, I do think a lot of that goes back to Joel and Bean and Ben Simmons, right? It's like you're going to be – you've talked about this a lot, right? And I, I wrote a profile on him a few years ago, similar things. Damian Lillard is kind of the, stand, the, the prime example of how a superstar – what – leadership and culture actually looks like not in the corny cliche ways that we talk about and you don't actually know what that means tangibly but there are tangible ways for a franchise superstar or franchise superstars to be examples to lead their team to actually make change and Embiid and Simmons have not shown the ability to do so yet um no (laughs) not not yet they're young um they're young I do think they can win together um I also I, look. I, it's boring to say this. There, I, I think it's possible that they can build a championship roster around those guys. I also, if you, if you force me to make a bet, is one of them traded in the next three years? I would bet that. Um, but I think all of the both of those things are possible. They stay together for ten years and win a championship eventually, mm-hmm. or this this process, um, this process ends. Well, to use a word, uh, this process <laughs> ends soon. Speaking of the process, let me just simplify this. Is Sam Hinkie still the president of the team if the Jaleel Okafor situation <laughs> doesn't go doesn't go haywire? And that's not note I how I phrase it. 
I didn't say if Jaleel Okafor's behavior is better because Jaleel Okafor was going through a lot of stuff personally and emotionally. And I think it's clear from your book, the team did not support him. As not, it, it, the team did not provide him the infrastructure he needed as a young player, a little bit out of his depth in the NBA. Um, they didn't have enough security. They did, we can go through the whole thing. So I'm not saying it's Jaleel Okafor's fault that he got caught. I mean, to some degree, everyone is accountable for their own behavior. I get that. But it's not as simple as saying Jaleel Okafor f***ed up and got in a bar fight in Boston and it was on TV and sped over the whatever bridge and this and that. But simplifying, if Jaleel Okafor is just a run-of-the-mill rookie that doesn't work out, no off-court incidents, you think Sam Hickey keeps the job? Ooh, um, that's a good one. I don't know how I want he what he's not relieved that quickly. Um, what happens as time goes on, I don't know. There was enough momentum throughout the league, whether it's from other major agents, like I, you know, someone told me Jeff Schwartz, who's a major agent, um, XL Sports, they represent a ton of players. Um, after Sam traded Michael Carter Williams without um, Jeff Schwartz felt like he wasn't given enough credit or enough, excuse me, notice. Um, he made a decree we will not be dealing with Sam Hankey anymore. Um, there's issues inside the building with Sam and especially Scott O'Neill, who we didn't mention before in terms of the Sixers power structure and people making decisions, the team CEO. who Well, the power structure, I'm glad you said that because <laughs> it's just a mess. There are <laughs> yeah. too many people in the room. There are too many people with decision-making power. And that's why it's so hard to parse like who made this decision. Brett Brown is the de facto GM for like a hot second and like during an important period of time. And then even um, then the minority owner is, is overruling on about who to draft, it's, right? <laughs> it's just like you, you just can't have this – like you want to have voices in a room. Yeah, you want to have a lot of smart people exchanging ideas in a room. You also just have to have a clear hierarchy of like this is the guy in the ownership group and this is the guy in the front office group. And these are the two guys – if the owner wants to be involved, these are the two guys who are going to make this decision. Anyway, I'm sorry. Continue. No, and I, I do believe I don't. I do believe that might be they might be closer to that now as the season's gone on in terms of some of the, uh, uh, you know, more organized, more organized, and it being more Elton. Right? Um, not all season, but I do believe that's happened recently. Um, in terms of Hinky, so yeah, there are all these forces. The union was angry at him. The league was angry. Opposing owners. I think this is always a key part, right? Like opposing owners were annoyed and. Josh Harris has made it very clear that he cares what other people think about him. And I do think part of the fun of owning an NBA team is that you can say you're owning an NBA team and it's probably not fun if all your other billionaire buddies are complaining to you about your team stinks and you're dragging our bottom line down and what the hell is going on over there. Um, like when By I, the way, it, only, yeah. in that, only in that one season when they went 10-72, and 72, that was the only year they had the worst record in the league. Yep. Like Orlando was about as bad as them for right. almost the entire capital P process. The whole, I mean, the narrative became larger than the, the story, than the actual thing, right? And, and you write that in your book. This has always bugged me about Hinky. What Hinky did was the simplest thing you could possibly do in the NBA. It wasn't complicated. It wasn't this like, oh my God, he discovered plutonium by <laughs> accident. You know, he just he all he did was tank. That's it. He got to a team that was out picks because of the Bynum disaster and was mediocre, and he blew it up. And he was going to tank for as long as possible. It's so obvious. It's so easy. You could do it. I could do it. It doesn't take a genius to do it. What it takes is buy-in from the people above you who know what kind of pain is coming. Now, there's a, there are degrees of it. And obviously, drafting injured players and not signing veterans and this and that took it to a pretty extreme degree. But it's so simple that the NBA changed the freaking rules so nobody could do right. it again. That's how easy it is. The NBA was like, no, no, we can't have this happening again. Our rules are too obvious. We need to make them less obvious. And the tanking thing's funny because Hinky gets labeled as the tanking guy and then you talk to people around him and it's like, he's not a tanking guy. He came from Houston. They had two, They had Tracy McGrady and Yao Ming. They didn't tank. It just, it was more of, you know, I always describe it as like the equation. We need to get to championship. This is where we are. How do we get from A to B? Okay, the best way is in this case, the tank, right? Um, I mean, what were we answering? Whether Hinky would still be there? So there are all these other forces around. Um, I don't know. It was getting tough for him. The, the Okafor, I always describe the Okafor thing as like the straw that broke the camel's back, to use a fantastic cliche. Um, it's just that, that being on TV, like I have a quote in there from the Sixers security guard, who security guy who says NBA security called him and said, the commissioner wants to know why one of our players is on TV. 
on TMZ for being drunk and no one from the Sixers has notified us. Um, it seems like a bad phone call to get. <laughs> I would say it's not great. Yeah, I would say it's not great. So it would have bought him a little more time for fair or not. And both, right? The um, I do think the tide was kind of turning against Hinky from all these. You know, the NBA is a small world. You know this, right? You're dealing with the same people over and over and over. And it can be hard if you kind of blow up all those relationships. Uh, what can they do now? <laughs> Uh, pray no. Um, the the Simmons and B thing is fascinating. You know, I wrote this a little bit today. I'd be curious to get your take on it. It's not. They're at a point now where, like, it used to be when you trade one of them because you don't think the fit is good, right? Now I think you have to look at: Do we need to trade one of them because there's no other way out of here, and that's our best way to kind of build. To, we basically go more for fit over talent, um, and that has to be part of the equation. Where that was never one of the issues before. Um, it's a great. It's a great way to put it because. Tobias to me is untra is no one's untradeable. Tobias is tradable only for an equally bad contract, right. and even even then, you, you you might have to incentivize Horford. Horford's trades only come in one of a few flavors. Number one, a team thinks it's Al Horford away from winning a championship. I don't think that team exists. No. Number two, you salary dump him to a team with cap room like the Pistons, and you attach a first round pick. And by the way, I think the Pistons say, "How about another one?" Because for we sure. have no use for Al Horford. Um, and number three is the same kind of deal we just talked about. You take out, you take someone else's problematic long-term contract, and you, you know, frankly, this gets even harder in a pandemic when I was no going to say that cap situation is going part, yep. to be like. I just don't know. There is no easy way out of any of this, and to me, the solution is then you just hunker down and eat it because I'm not trading those one of those guys from a position of weakness. You can trash Simmons all you want. You put Simmons on the market, there are going to be teams lined up to give you mm -hmm. stuff for Ben Simmons. They're going to be, Embiid is is trickier. You could get a lot of stuff for Embiid, but there are questions about his health and his conditioning and all of that, which is why I've always said it's it's easier to talk in theory about dealing and uh, dealing Simmons and building your team around Embiid. I mean, that's a very simple thing: spacing and Joel Embiid. That works. Um, okay, you got to have faith that Joel Embiid is going to be healthy for five to ten years. Um, so I don't I don't know what they're gonna do, but I'll tell you this, finding an Al Horford trade ain't easy. No, like what if he was on the market now, what what, what contract let's say he was a free agent right now, what would he get? Amid a pandemic, uh, a one year contract. Right. A one year contract of some amount from the mid level exception from a team that's trying to win or is capped out to I, I don't I don't know what else, but I don't I don't see a multi year contract for him. You know, and and you have teams that are still trying to save up cap space for the Giannis summer and the other people summer. I just you know, they they are uh, in a very tough spot. Um, I will say in the in all of everyone's rush to bury everyone on the team, I do think everyone has the token sentence in their stories or their <laughs> podcast that's like, well, just FYI, Ben Simmons was out. Yes. That that has to be more than a token <laughs> sentence. Ben Simmons is an All NBA level player. You take a player like that off of any team, like it's going to be a problem for most teams. Although the yes. way Paul George is playing, you could take him off the Clippers right now. It wouldn't <laughs> be that big of a problem. Uh, now Paul George will probably score thirty-five tomorrow, but like that's a real thing. It's not an excuse. Like that's you took Jimmy Butler off the Heat. You take uh, you know Kyle Lowry off the Raptors. It's like it's kind of a problem. And it's more than I know you sometimes, but the Celtics had missed Gordon Hayward, and Gordon Hayward is really good. But the the value of those individual players to their respective teams, I do not think is com comparable. Um, I agree. Yeah, and I listen. I did today. I wrote this whole thing, and I realized because oh, oh, there's okay. no other way to do it. It's right. like you know, the the team didn't work, but this thing happened. You have to. I don't know how artfully to do it. You know. By the way, because. The Mavs won a game last night against the Clippers without Kristaps Porzingis. Like, you have to find a way. And by the way, one of the guys that helped the win was Trey Burke, who the Sixers well, had and let go for nothing. A, uh, you're saying they could use a point guard who can score, dribble, and pass a little bit? That's something the Sixers might be able to use right now? <laughs> what a fascinating... Uh, I feel like the process is definitely over. I think it's fitting that it began with too many centers and is ending with too many centers. <laughs> um, and... I feel like it's one of the first stories that I've been able to see from beginning to end. Long-term story arcs in my time covering the NBA. Um, 
But, you know, the Sixers are going to have to pivot and they're going to have to figure it out. And um, any final thoughts here? Now, I think you're the first uh, one of these book promo things that I wasn't asked. So did the process work? That's usually the uh, one of the early questions I get, which I never know how to answer. Um, they didn't finish the process. It's unfinished. I, I agree. I would agree. I always use the analogy like if you hire an architect to redo your house and then yank him off the job halfway through, can you judge the architect, right? Um so final thoughts. No, I think uh, it's been quite a ride. I will say this. I will say that. Um, all right. You're on Weitzman's book, Tanking to the Top. Buy it. You will learn stuff. And um, and it's a totally entertaining read. You're on. Find another team to write. Find another slant. Okay. Find another team to write <laughs> about good. now that the that's Sixers good. are out. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Zach.